Okay, we're picking back up in our notes. Um, we're talking about uh, Roman numeral four muscle metabolism. And so the big thing here is essentially how do muscle cells get energy and use energy to sustain various activities. And so we need to start really with a reminder of ATP, that cellular energy molecule. I'll explain some things over here in just a second. Remember, um, we talked about in our last learning target, we talked about ATP as an energy molecule is really broken down by removing one of its three phosphates. And so I would cue you to kind of look over here at this little GIF that is showing removal of one phosphate. When the bond breaks and that phosphate group is removed, energy is released from that bond having been broken. What you are left with then is a molecule that's basically the same except is missing a phosphate. And so instead of calling it ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate, we now call it ADP, which stands for adenosine diphosphate, because it only has two phosphates on it. Now, the in term, if you remember back in chemistry, uh, products at the end of a chemical reaction, products here are that ADP molecule and the free floating phosphate that has been sort of ejected. What we were trying to do is harvest the energy that comes from that bond being broken. And so we're going to see the use of the energy, but we also have to sort of acknowledge that we have these physical chemical components that are remaining called ADP and a free floating phosphate. This diagram down here, if you think back to your chemistry days, shows you that reaction. So here's our reactant, our ATP molecule, and then the process occurs. We remove a phosphate and we have the rest of the phosphates attached to the original molecule. So reactants over here, products over here, including that release of energy, which is really what we were going for. Now, the great thing about this is we could run this reaction in reverse. So we could essentially recreate ATP by collecting an ADP molecule and reattaching a free floating phosphate. And so we could run the reaction this way as well, and we could make ATP using the products from the previous reaction. So really this sort of cycle it's a little bit like a rechargeable battery. So ATP is the energized form. The energy exists in the battery or in the battery, in the bonds. When we break the bond, uh, we release that energy and the battery is sort of depleted. And that's the ADP form. If we want to re-energize it, all we do is pop a phosphate back on. The energy is stored in the bond that is created when we put that phosphate back on and we have now the energized form again, ATP. So we will kind of need to remember this whole cyclical nature of ATP breaks down into ADP and then we can reform ATP by popping a phosphate on the ADP. So energy is needed for muscle contractions. That energy is going to be ATP. And so as we move forward, we're going to look at where does the ATP come from? How much ATP can we create from a particular metabolism process? And how quickly does it get used up? Which lets us think about how long it's going to function in our bodies, helping us contract our muscles. So we're going to come back to this diagram at the end, but I'll show you you have sort of a spectrum of activities here. So you have um, sort of initially starting your activity, uh, a bit of a sprint that uses ATP that's already stored in your muscle cells immediately. And that lasts for about six seconds. So six seconds of any sort of high intensity exercise is just utilizing ATP that's already stored in your body. But then you run out. And so then you have to start creating ATP to supply the energy demands of that muscle. And so we'll see that, inner, that ATP is created next by a, a process called direct phosphorylation phosphorylation 
but that only lasts for a small amount of time. And so if we need more energy, if we're doing something that lasts essentially longer than 16 seconds, according to this diagram, then we need to kick into another metabolic strategy to gather even more ATP to power us through. Now, this last one is an additional kind of understanding of what if you need really long-term um, energy supplies? What if you're doing something that's incredibly endurance related? Uh, think about marathons, triathlons, how in the world can you supply your body with that much energy to sustain, sustain hours of activity? So we'll talk about all of those in the next couple of slides. So the first thing that I want to talk about is that fast acting energy. So after you've depleted what has been stored in your muscles, which according to the diagram previous, that was about six seconds into an activity, you need to start cranking out some energy pretty quickly. And so the ATP here in this sense comes from a process called direct phosphorylation. And so direct phosphorylation takes an existing protein floating in the cell called creatine phosphate. It's abbreviated in most of the diagrams as CP. So it takes creatine phosphate that's already existing in the cell and it borrows the phosphate. And it takes that phosphate and pops it onto an ADP molecule, creating ATP, re-energizing that um, rechargeable battery that we talked about making ATP. So by removing the phosphate from creatine phosphate and giving it to the ADP molecule, we get a little bit of ATP. And that's what we see here happening in this diagram. So you have free floating creatine phosphate, and then you have the, the remnants, the leftovers of the ATP that was burned the first six seconds stored in your muscles. So we've got those leftovers, those products, ADPs floating around. Let's re-energize these ADPs. We have to put a phosphate on it to create ATP, that phosphate is going to come from this. So if we borrow the phosphate, what's left over this molecule called creatine. So creatine is probably something that you've heard of if you are um, anywhere in like the, the world of trying to build muscle mass, training, uh, weightlifting. A lot of recovery drinks have creatine phosphate in them so that you can re or sort of re-energize this creatine um, by adding a phosphate to it. So if you didn't have a, an, a supplement after your workout that sort of sped up this activity, that creatine phosphate would reform naturally in your body when you are resting. But a lot of people will um, that are intentionally trying to build muscle mass, they will supplement by taking uh, recovery drinks that have creatine phosphate in it to sort of um, give your body back that creatine phosphate quicker than if you just waited for it to naturally reform at rest. Now, what I want to point out is the good thing about direct phosphorylation and the reason that it kicks in so quickly is because you don't really need a huge oxygen supply to run this metabolic strategy, which means you don't have to wait for um, oxygen to have circulated out to the tissues to start creating ATP molecules. The downside of it is that because there's no oxygen needed and because we're creating less ATP um, in the absence of oxygen, it's a pretty fast acting energy source. So about 15 seconds, after um, you, you have depleted your initial storage of ATP, you have depleted ATP that could have been created by creatine phosphate because really you've burned up all the creatine phosphate that you had. So it's a very fast acting energy source. It will power you through things like sprints, um, but then you again hit a wall, you run out of ATP, and we have to progress to the next metabolism strategy. So if we're working out anything longer than sort of 15 to 20 seconds, we need to create more ATP. So let's talk about anaerobic glycolysis. Anaerobic glycolysis is a process that uses glucose that you have taken in from a meal, and it breaks that glucose down to create ATP.
And so if you have eaten glucose, if your glucose levels are uh, remotely high, or if you have glucose stored in your liver, then you have um, a larger sort of initial storage unit of potential energy than the creatine phosphate gave you that was stored in, in your body as well. So this is going to use sort of components of our food really to help power us a little bit more, to make a little bit more energy. Now, what happens as the glucose is being broken down is that um, we, in the process of breaking glucose down and harvesting ATP, we leave behind a product that is called pyruvic acid. And so here's the deal with pyruvic acid. If you can't move that pyruvic acid into a mitochondria, it converts into something called lactic acid, which is a little bit of a misnomer. And we'll talk about that in class. Lactic acid is really something called lactate and it gets a bad rap, right? If you've heard of lactic acid, you've probably thought before, oh, lactic acid makes my muscles sore. Er, not really. So lactic acid, which is now referred to as lactate, we'll, we'll call it lactate. Lactate, um, actually doesn't make your muscles sore. And we'll talk about that in just a second. The good news about anaerobic glycolysis is that you, again, don't need any oxygen to run this metabolic strategy, which means you can kick it into gear pretty quickly, which is necessary because your first two strategies, right, using ATP initially in, stored in your cells, that's gone about six seconds. The next 15 seconds, you've burned up all your creatine phosphate. So about 20 seconds into an activity, you need anaerobic glycolysis to start creating some ATP for you. And that's really fast. And so if we needed oxygen to have circulated out to our tissues to um, allow for this process to happen, it would take a little bit longer than the 15 or so seconds that we need uh, for it to kick into gear. So no oxygen needed is great. The, the negative to that is that it's not going to last that long. So again, without oxygen, we deplete our initial energy source pretty quickly and we stop cranking out ATP. So one thing that I want to, to kind of go back to is the lactate conversation. So number one, um, one of the things that I feel like is a bit of a misunderstanding is that lactic acid doesn't uh, build up long-term in your tissues. In fact, we recent studies have shown that within about 30 minutes of you completing your exercise or your activity, that lactate diffuses out of your muscle tissues and it is um, sort of cycled back. And that's what I'm showing you right here. Here's your muscle tissues. Here's activity. The lactate uh, collects, but then it filters from the blood into your liver and hangs out in your liver for a little while. So within 30 minutes of your activity, your lactate's really out of your skeletal muscles. And so it's not making your muscles sore. Something else is making your muscles sore. Um, and one of the reasons it's not making your muscles sore is because it's not really in your muscles. About a half an hour after you work out, it, it's stored back in your liver. And notice lactate stored in your liver will convert itself back into glucose, which was in part our initial sort of energy source that we needed. So lactate Lactate, number one, doesn't hang out in your muscle cells for very long. It's not making your muscles sore. And it's actually not bad. It's a good thing because it's going to help regenerate some glucose, which could be um, used again in this anaerobic glycolysis pathway. So there is something that does make your muscle sore, and that's coming next week. You can kind of see it here in this diagram. It's called DOMS, Delayed Onset Muscle Soreness, and it's really the result of you tearing your individual myofibrils as you are working out so that your body will repair them and build that muscle back larger and stronger. So we'll get into that next week, but lactic acid really isn't a thing um, related to muscle soreness. In fact, the word itself really should be replaced with lactate. And um, it's not a bad, it's not really a bad thing. So I just wanted to clear up that misconception that oftentimes students have when they, when we hit this content, we think, oh no, I've worked out. Lactic acid is built up. It has made me sore. Mm -mm, not really.
So let's play out what happens if we need more than a minute's worth of activity, right? Or a minute's worth of ATP. So now if we have a couple of things, if we have the pyruvic acid from the previous process in the presence of a mitochondria, so if we can move that pyruvic acid into a mitochondria, we can do this last metabolic strategy, which is called aerobic respiration. Now, if you remember all the way back to your biology days, you probably learned of this as cellular respiration, and it is exactly the same process. This is using sugar, converting it into pyruvic acid in the process that we just talked about, and then sending that pyruvic acid into a mitochondria to further break it down and make even more energy. Some fancy terms that you could or should associate with aerobic respiration are oxidative respiration and oxidative phosphorylation. Either of those two words essentially mean this process that we're getting ready to talk about. So this is something that happens inside of a mitochondria. And so if a mitochondria is present, the pyruvate that was part of the product from the previous reaction we just saw is going to move into the mitochondria and make a whole bunch of ATP. In fact, it makes about 36 ATP molecules per glucose that started the initial um, process. For perspective, what we just saw a second ago, anaerobic respiration only cranks out about two ATPs per glucose molecule. So this is a considerable amount of ATP that's being created if we have a mitochondria and if we have oxygen present. So this is a long lasting continual production of ATP um, which helps to power us through these endurance activities. So anything that's more than a couple of minutes would be considered an endurance activity here, but especially noting things like marathons, very much endurance activities. So the kicker here is that we need to have oxygen present. We need to have a mitochondria present. And of course, we need that initial amount of glucose. Now, if you are doing one of these super long endurance activities, the biggest strategy would be to um, carb load prior to so that you could store up as much glucose as possible in your skeletal muscles, in your liver to have this initial glucose here to run through the cycle. And then you could probably obviously think that the more you have trained and the more you have really um, trained your respiratory system to efficiently move oxygen in and out of your body, you're going to be able to supply that oxygen demand. So if you've carb loaded and you have trained to the point that you can supply the oxygen demand, in theory, your body can keep cranking out energy and you can do these really, really long activities. So let's go back to where we started in the beginning. So we talked about how initially and as you begin an activity, your body is using ATP that is stored in your muscle cells, but that's very, very short, short acting. And so about six seconds into the activity, you have to switch gears and you have to start making ATP really, really fast. And so the easiest and fastest way to make ATP after six seconds is this thing called direct phosphorylation, and you're going to borrow the phosphate from creatine phosphate that exists hanging out in your cells. That, of course, runs out pretty quickly, and so if you would like to uh, progress further, you would move into using glycogen or glucose is the broken down form of glycogen. You would use glucose to power um, the production of ATP. Initially, you could use the anaerobic pathway right, the pathway that doesn't require mitochondria and doesn't require ox oxygen to break down that sugar. And you'll make a little bit of ATP. But if you're looking to really do a sustained activity, something more than a minute or so, you need to kick into this final stage of ATP production, which happens inside of the mitochondria with lots and lots of oxygen present. Now, I know that there's a chart in your notes following we're going to talk about that chart in class next week, and we'll continue to move forward. So when you are done with this slide, you are done with today's lecture.